on this website of Loughborough University. Um, so I now give the floor to Sabols, who will introduce the panel member, and I hope you will enjoy uh, this session and hope to welcome you in the future. Thank you. Um, thank you, Eric. Um, it is my honor and pleasure to introduce uh, three excellent, outstanding scholars in nationalism studies. And for the first meeting, uh, we tried to make sure that we can attract speakers who are known not only as expert in specific um, subfields in nationalism studies, but are, but, but are also um, experts in nationalism studies as such. So they understand the big picture as well. And um, um, all our speakers today, on top of all this, um, are also um, scholars who have a very broad knowledge about contemporary politics. So I'm very glad that uh, we can welcome today uh, three excellent scholars, Zsuzsa Cergő, Sinisha Malashevitz, and uh, Umut Oskarimli. Um, they will be delivering very short 10 minute um, long um, just speaks um, um, and that we will start with and it will be followed by a broader discussion. So I was asked by the organizers to be as brief as possible concerning the introduction. So uh, what I, I'm planning to do is just to give really a three sentence introduction to each of the panelists. Um, not that they need any long introduction. I guess all the participants know their works pretty well. So the first speaker today will be Zsuzsa Cergő, uh, Professor of Political Studies at Queen's University in Kingston, Canada. Zsuzsa's work focuses on the study of nationalism in post-communist Central and Eastern Europe, with a particular attention to the relations between majority and minority groups. Uh, Zsuzsa has also served as the chair of the Association for the Study of Nationalism for how many? Six years? Between 2013 and 2019, a very long time. Um, I've worked with her and that she, she made um, an excellent organization of the ASN, which was already huge and very successful, but under Zsuzsa's leadership, that became the most important um, uh, organization in the study of nationalism. Um, so Zsuzsa, um, the floor is yours. You have 10 minutes and then I will, um, we will pass it on to Sinisha and then to Umut. I will introduce them before they start their speeches. Thank you very much, Sabolc, uh, for this generous introduction. And thank you for inviting me to this virtual event. I really appreciate everyone's uh, time because there are so many webinars, so, so much going on, especially, especially now, and especially in connection to um, what's going on in uh, Russia's, with, uh, around Russia's war war in Ukraine. And I really appreciated that we are here um, trying to discipline ourselves and talk about the bigger um, picture as well and, and questions about nationalism. And um, I would like to add that the Association for the Study of Nationalism, nationalism one, of the, one of the achievements, I think, of the association in recent years has been to try to broaden the focus so that um, you know, the traditional regions of ESN have been uh, Europe and Eurasia. Then um, we added more work and more members from also from um, the Middle East and and now, since we created Virtual ESN in May 2020, and I'm uh, the director of Virtual ESN, this is a third new pillar of ESN. And this allows us to globalize it further so that we can bring in uh, scholars from other regions of the world. And this has been, I shouldn't call it a pet project, but something that has been, um, has been um, an idea that several of us uh, in the leadership of ASN have been thinking about for years that we do not want to abandon our regional uh, focus on Europe and Eurasia, but at the same time, 
especially after the association became um, the largest uh, in the field of nationalism and ethnic studies, we do want to we do want to expand the conversation and make it more cross-regional, more comparative, more theoretical. So I, I wanted to preface what I'm saying with this that I am aware of, of the significance of networks that are connecting nationalism scholars. And uh, I believe that it's, it's uh, hugely significant that we expand the network and make it more inclusive and especially make it inclusive of, of younger scholars who are working on cases in other parts of the world. And, and so this is what we are trying to do um, in virtual, virtual ESN. But uh, let me go back to to um, present, presenting, presenting thoughts about why nationalism studies as a field um, exists and not only exists, but has become stronger, uh, broader and, and, and deeper, richer in many ways in, in recent, recent years. And just to state the trivial first, um, nationalism is a constant feature of life in, in the international system. It's present everywhere in politics and society. It's present even when we don't see it in people's everyday lives. There's now a rich literature about everyday nationalism. We also know that it varies and changes. Its presence and salience also vary and change. But the reason why the field of nationalism studies exists um, and is getting stronger is that there is an underlying assumption among a large number of scholars that there are some commonalities, some aspects, components, patterns of behavior among political actors, social actors that we can identify and compare and that will help us to gain a better understanding of this persistent feature of our lives. And, and so, if we think about what the literature, nationalism scholarship tells us about what those components are, I would, to simplify it, list the three main ones, which are that nationalism always involves nationhood, it always involves homeland, it always involves self-government. But we also know that each of these components is always contested. Nationhood meaning what? Uh, there is a literature on nationalism as a force of unity, but we also know that nationalism both unites and divides. It unites selectively. Anthony Marx has uh, said, talked about selective inclusion as a driving logic of nationalism from start, ever since it emerged um, in his view in early modern Spain. And we also have learned from the literature that division is not simply inter-ethnic, but deep intra-ethnic cleavages can exist about the meaning of nationhood. And they can become major sources of polarization as we see uh, in, in the US, Hungary, and other examples today. And then homeland, meaning what? This is another social contract that has different and competing, conflicting interpretations. Uh, what are the lands that belong to a nation? Uh, nationalism literature reveals that this, not only that the same piece of land can be considered a homeland by multiple nations, and members of the nation can have different ideas about what their homeland is, but that the homeland can shift. And we know examples like Poland having been pushed to the west on the map. Um, after World War II. We also know that there is literature about how, how the homeland of, uh, of a nation that has a long history, like the Jewish homeland, um, is, also, is also shifting in the minds of people. So the third component, self-government meaning what? There used to be an assumption that national self-government requires some form of democracy, but what about nationalism in authoritarian states? Chinese nationalism today, Russian nationalism today, and so on. Not to mention the association of nationalism with democratic backsliding that we see in the US, in India, Hungary, Poland, etc. So all of this is to say that nationalism studies has uncovered that ambiguity and contestation are built into 
this thing we call nationalism. And we also know a great deal about the tensions within nationalism, that it unifies and divides at the same time, that it provides people with some deeply held truth about their need for community and common purpose, while also giving them myths about their national biographies. We also see that it can be easily associated with any regime. And in that sense, it's different from political ideologies in a proper sense of the world, of the word. And that's also why it can be, it's part of the reason why it can be persistent and powerful because it can be associated with different types of regime. And, but we don't necessarily know why that is the case because nationalism studies, studies itself has a biography that is in some ways similar to the way um, national biographies evolve that, that there, there is a story, a canon in nationalism studies that has been created and built by scholars who were positioned in a particular time or particular and particular places so positionality mattered and once that framework was created everyone who was in the field of nationalism studies and wanted to publish and wanted to be recognized had to situate ourselves in that within the banks of that of that river that we were trying to trying to create and so for a long time nationalism scholars were writing a grand overarching narrative about where nationalism comes from, where, when, why it emerged, the places, the main protagonists, the drivers, factors that brought it about, which, as I said, it's somewhat similar to national biographies, if you think, think about it. And so beyond the intellectual curiosity about where it came from, there was also an underlying notion that if we know under what conditions it emerged, and we can write a coherent account about it, if you will, a coherent short biography for nationalism, then we will understand the reasons for its existence and we might also be able to predict its course. And scholars differently situated, differently positioned scholars had different reasons why they were looking to understand the reasons for nationalism's existence, uh, depending on, on the historical context. After World War II, for instance, many social scientists were turning away from nationalism because it had shown its hideous face during the war. And those who were exploring the story of nationalism did so because they wanted it to go away. Famously, Hobsbawm, for example. But several of the foundational books about nationalism that created the storyline um, of, the, of, of the canon of nationalism studies were published in the 1980s, Hobsbawm, but also Gellner, Anderson. They were written from the European perspective, except for Anderson, who was writing about the emergence of nationalism as a response to European core uh, uh, colonizing nation building. And he situated its emergence in the Americas and the colonies. And so that was the creation, you know, the, as, I, as, I, as I mentioned, the, of the canon. And what we've seen in research in recent um, decades has been a broadening as scholars from outside the West have been entering the field in greater numbers. So the biography of nationalism is changing and nationalism studies is becoming stronger and richer, but also somewhat more methodologically diverse, which always poses a danger of, of methodological fragmentation. But nonetheless, I believe it's fundamentally important for the future of nationalism studies that scholars from different regions be heard, their work be used not only as case study material for theory building that happens by scholars in the West, but but that scholars in different regions of the world who are studying nationalism become uh, recognized and, and uh, become theory builders. 
Also about positionality, after the end of the Cold War, many scholars became interested in nationalism in the 1990s because it became such an obvious visible force. And again, many were hoping that it would disappear once liberal democracy becomes dominant around the world. There was this underlying uh, expectation even that if Europeans had led the way to nationalism, maybe the European Union could show us how to lead it away from it, how to tame it. But here we are 30 years after what was thought to be the end of the Cold War. And what we see is that nationalism is powerful and that nationalism is connected to security. And so this is something that I think I'd like to highlight this connection between nationalism and security that is one of the aspects of nationalism that has been understudied or studied in, in a somewhat one-dimensional way in nationalism scholarship. And, and that I think has to do with the broader question of looking at what appeals to people in nationalism, why it becomes such a powerful mobilizational force. And I, I believe it has to do with security. And I use security as a broad concept that includes both the individual and group level aspects of security and the securitization strategies that political actors, leaders use to justify actions in defense of the nation. I think we have to step back and look at how security informs um, the mobilizational power of, of nationalism. And I think here's a field where, here's, here's, here, here's a point where nationalism studies could continue to learn from social psychology. Nationalism studies, we always feature it and pride ourselves in, in, in being multidisciplinary. But at the same time, what we can notice is that there is a lot of political science in, in the recent decades of nationalism scholarship. And there, there is obviously foundational work written by sociologists mostly, Gellner and Anderson, and uh, also later Brubaker, Wimmer and others. But there is still a need to bring in more social psychology. And I'm hoping that Sinisha will talk about this a little bit as well and address this. I remember when Henry Hale, a political scientist, uh, published his piece of, uh, titled Understanding Ethnicity in 2004 in Comparative Political Studies. It was a big deal. He was looked at as a trailblazer among nationalism scholars, especially political scientists, when he, he decided to go and, and look into what social psychology literature has to say about the need for ethnicity. And he said that ethnicity was a social radar screen that people used to reduce uncertainty. So it's, it, became, it became influential because there was such a need for someone to, to say things like this, that it has to do with some kind of need for uncertainty reduction. And this social radar is used differently at different times in different settings is something that he also said. And, um, and there, there, were, there, were, there is a generation of, of, of students, PhD students who, who followed up on this and, and looked into this, but I think we have to go back to it and, and look at what this need is, why it is that uh, uncertainty reduction becomes part of the way of, uh, of nationalism's mobilizational, mobilizational power. Uh, the need for uncertainty, uncertainty reduction does not go away. If anything, it increases with the emergence of great power politics again, conflicts around polarity coming back, climate change and its consequences for demographic change. Populations are aging in most countries where nation building has been successful and nationness is broadly and deeply internalized in many places, but climate change and migration increases insecurities in those countries as well. And so I think this is something that we need to, um, to do more on. Uh, it's it's one, of, one of the areas in which national studies will need to do more. 
And, and also, I want to mention that um, the big theme of the current time about the connection between nationalism and, and democracy is again something that we can link back to what the literature has provided so far, the uh, literature on, on the civic ethnic nation debate had to do with this, about this ambiguity at the core of nationalism's relationship with democracy. And, but it, it also reminds us that, that there, is this, there is this tension between majoritarian nation building and persistent minority populations that future research needs to explore further the question of what makes persistent minority populations invested into being part of the political community and being democratic agents, actors, members of a political community. And there is actually very little comparative literature on this. And um, this is something that, again, the current war on, uh, in Ukraine and the reaction of Russian-speaking uh, Ukrainians and the reaction of Russian-speaking Estonians, Latvians, Lithuanians uh, is showing us that an external shock like a war can help minority actors to make a difference between their ethnic identification and their political belonging to a state. But there must be other forms of incentivizing um, of, of also making persistent minority populations invested into membership in the state. So I'm going to stop there and, um, and um, I'll be looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Zuza. We already have lots of food for thought. Um, our, our second speaker will be Sinisha Malashevich, um, Chair in Sociology at um, University College Dublin. Um, Sinisha's main research interests include the, the study of nationalism, the study of war and organized violence, ethnicity, nation states. Um, he has also, uh, his works has been translated into many languages, 13, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And let me also mention that um, um, Sinisha is also member of the steering committee of the ASEN. I don't really know, sometimes it's pronounced ASEN, sometimes it's ASN. Um, the, um, the other huge and excellent organization in the study of nationalism, uh, the Association for the Study of Ethnicity and Nationalism is currently based in, uh, in Edinburgh, if I'm not mistaken. Um, excellent organization with uh, another um, uh, series of annual conferences and online talks. So, Sinisha, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Sabus, and thanks to Gazim and Eric for organizing this event and for inviting us, all three of us. Since I'm a sociologist, I will uh, focus on slightly different issues, but I, I agree with many points that uh, Zhuzha has made there, and, and there are so many overlaps. Just to say before I start that <clears throat> I think the study of nationalism reminds me to some extent to the, you know, some sort of a relatively marginal sport like weightlifting or taekwondo, uh, you know, and then when the Olympic, Olympics come, everybody's interested in these sports if they are winning medals <laughs> and everybody becomes an expert and glued and watching them as soon as the Olympics are over, nobody pays attention to these sports. So I think nationalism has a little bit of that flair. If there's a big event, you know, if there's a, some war or violence happening, if there's a revolution, people become interested, journalists become interested, general public and general commentators, become, everybody becomes an expert on nationalism. But as soon as this event is over, nationalism becomes sort of a marginal thing. Uh, but, uh, so, so I think that we have that problem in a way with the studies of nationalism. And, and, and Zhuzha is completely right. You know, nationalism, for scholars of nationalism, is there all the time. It's everywhere. We see it, you know, uh, and, and, and it's, it's, it's expanding, it's growing, it's becoming much more grounded, as I would say. So we often have these references to kind of rising nationalism, you know, the collapse of communism, and that was also the case later on with the Arab Spring, and, and then, uh, you know, more recently with Brexit and Trump, and now again with the uh, war in Ukraine, we see always these references to nationalism rising, because it, it is more visible, it's more aggressive, but in, in reality, nationalism, you know, is there all the time. So, so in a sense, that's what we are trying to do as, as scholars of nationalism, trying to see these these kind of institutionalized, institutionalized forms of nationalism, everyday forms of nationalism, 
the way how nationalism really uh, is, is, is strongest when it's least visible. So what I want to focus on is really four, four topics for different areas, which I think are, are developing, emerging and vibrant in, in the contemporary nationalism studies. And later on, we can talk maybe about the future as well. I think one of the areas which I think is very, very promising, very good, and has been developing for the last maybe couple of decades, and, and it's a sort of a parallel development within history and historical sociology, and this is the kind of rethinking the relationship between nationalism and imperialism and nation states and empires. So the kind of conventional traditional story had, uh, you know, and, and empires as a thing of the past and nation states kind of replacing them as being mutually exclusive phenomena. Uh, well, now uh, scholars emphasize much more, provide much more subtle analysis and, and look at the continuities and uh, in, in terms of organization, in terms of ideology, they look a little bit on, on, on kind of how uh, empires have, you know, have really continued to exist much longer than we thought. Uh, you know, we always see empires as a thing of, you know, 19th century predominantly and, you know, disappearing largely in, in, in the beginning of the, of the 20th century and kind of the, the, the watershed moment being the Second World War. Uh, but now we know, you know, much more that one can be a nation state and have imperial features and not to mention obviously what's happening at the very moment in Ukraine and with Russia being both nation states with the imperial amb ambitions. So there's a lot of really interesting research going on, you know, from Ju uh, Julian Govo and, and, and Sandra Halpering and, and Krishna Kumar and many others on, on kind of rethinking this relationship between nation states and empire. And, and kind of questioning the conventional traditional stories that still dominate kind of textbooks about uh, nations as prison, ho prison houses, as empires as prison houses of nations and the idea of national longing for independence in, in the context of Habsburgs, Ottomans, Romanos and so on. Uh, this, this is also, I think we can link that there's a lot of obviously really good research on also on the, on the notion of national indifference, you know, starting from uh, uh, Jeremy King all the way to, to Judson and Ta uh, Tara Zahar and many others who have also showed us how kind of in a historical context, uh, empires have played an important part in nationalizing populations. So, so a lot of this really had less to do with the nationalist movements that sell much more with the way how imperial organizational structures function. Uh, and we can bring this all to, to contemporary context in a sense of you know, how we could see in the last few decades how the whole uh, a social political order has become questioned before we had this notion that nation states, borders of nation states are not to be questioned. They're fixed, they're stable, they're internationally recognized. But, you know, number of wars, uh, you know, most recently, obviously with the, with the Crimean, uh, with the occupation by Russia and the Syrian war, where we see Turkey and we see Russia, we see US, before that ISIS as well. These were all attempts to kind of uh, contest the notion of stable borders and, and kind of questioning, bringing some of the kind of uh, imperial language back uh, in, in, into much more visibility. Uh, so, so that's one of the areas which I think is very good, very, very interesting, and it's developing uh, you know, very much so. The second area is obviously something very uh, developed in, in, in quite well known in, 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 in among the audience here, and that's the everyday nationalism. And I think there's a, a wonderful uh, uh, a lot of empirical, empirical studies on this, uh, not everyday uh, nationalist routines, the way how nationalism is normalized and naturalized. Uh, you know, it, it is interesting when, when Bill wrote this book in 1995, there, there was very few studies you know, that picked it up. It was still marginal phenomenon. Now it has become a mainstream really in, in many respects, which is good. But what, what, what we could see more of it are two things. One is kind of greater link with the theory. I think there is a you know, wider area, at least in sociology, sociology of everyday life, which goes all the way to a favor and to some extent, Shegelov and Bourdieu, uh, and, and we have the whole areas of symbolic interactionism and methodology where we can make kind of much stronger links in trying to understand how this kind of everyday nationhood is linked with everyday life in general, you know, how routine, uh, you know, much of our life is routine. It's everyday, it's boring, it's habitual. Uh, and, and then, you know, why and how nationhood fits into that and how it's shaped by other processes. Uh, and, and I think some people do that, you know, John Fox has done it. And as you mentioned, he will be giving a talk here in June. Uh, he's done really, there's a really nice article where he kind of uh, uses Garfinkel's preaching experiments uh, in the context of nationalism, trying to understand, you know, how we can use these existing theoretical tools to, to deep, deep, uh, a little bit deeper into the kind of dig deeper into the, uh, you know, this relationship between sociology of everyday life and nationalism. 
Uh, the second issue is, is, is the kind of attempt to historicize this. Uh, I think this is also important. Uh, a lot of kind of everyday nationalism tends to focus on, on kind of contemporary context, which, which makes sense in many respects. But what's missing is this historical structural context. Some people have done more of the kind of historical uh, analysis of everyday nationalism. Uh, Alexander Maxwell has done uh, this uh, to some extent, but uh, you know, there's more need to do this, to, to kind of break, bring more links between the macro, meso and, and micro worlds of everyday nationalism. So to historicize this everyday, uh, to, just to see also, to understand how the, the banal and everyday and habitual can transform into violent, because this is also an interesting thing which hasn't been studied much. You know, where's this, you know, why some nationalism can becomes, become violence and others don't. So that leads me to the third topic, uh, uh, which is the relationship between nationalism and organized violence. So there are a lot of obviously great studies on, on, on specific wars and specific revolutions and genocides and terrorism and their link with nationalism, but we don't have enough, I think, again, theoretical general attempts to, to analyze kind of broader patterns of, of this why, when, how some nationalism become entangled with violence and others. You know, for example, this very conflict in Ukraine has come to surprise to many people, you know, how suddenly something like this can happen. Uh, uh, you know, and, and why nationalism that was there, both our Russian and Ukrainian, uh, suddenly ended up in this uh, dreadful war that is happening, while many other nationalisms don't, you know, and, and, and that's interesting. So we do obviously have research on, you know, John Hutchinson has written extensively on this, on nationalism and war, and uh, Andreas Swimmer and Waves of War. I've also, and John Hall have written on this uh, and have edited the book. On this uh, particularly, uh, there is a really good book just uh, uh, published by Randall Collins, more new book on, on kind of macro uh, uh, level violence and, and its link with nationalism. He talks about this, these, uh, what he calls the time bubbles of nationalism. He's written about this before, but this is kind of now book length type of analysis trying to see how, uh, you know, Dirkamian collective effervescence uh, can be, uh, you know, in a, in a sense, tamed, and at some points it just explodes and it cannot last for long periods of time. And it is interesting how this all works. And uh, generally, uh, you know, it tells us a lot about, let's say, again, uh, uh, to, un to understand, we can see what's happening in front of our, 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 our eyes in, in Ukraine, how nationalism, you know, how uh, violence can become a mobilizing power. Now, everybody has flags of Ukraine, you know, everywhere, where you, you go. And before that, we, we would think of nationalism much more as a kind of right-wing phenomenon now. Nationalism is associated with this kind of solidarity with, the, with, the, with a particular country attacked by, by another much more powerful country. And we could see also how people behave internally. You know, people who weren't particularly keen on, 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 on the identifying with the state suddenly are willing to fight and eventually die for their states. So this is really interesting to see because we know about all of this, you know, from previous wars, but now we can see that uh, in, on, on our screens, you know, playing out alive. And the uh, a final fourth uh, uh, topic that is worth, I think, exploring uh, is, is relationship between nationalism and, and modern subjectivities. So we do have a kind of lot of scholarship on mod multiple modernities on, and connected modernities on solidarity, sociability, power, belonging. Uh, and, uh, you know, a lot of kind of research that Jujar also referred to classical, uh, you know, uh, canonical works have focused on the question uh, of, of modernity of nationalism, but, it, you know, there has been less focus on, on the question, what, what, why, is, why is modernity nationalist? So we know that nationalism is modern, but the question, really important question is, why do we have nationalism in modernity? Why we keep, uh, you know, thinking along the nation centric categories? Why are these still very much uh, informing our uh, 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 vision of the world and things like that. So, so in that sense, why do we live in a nation-centric world? Why uh, is nationalism such a malleable ideology that can shift from the far right to the far left and anything in between? Um, and also, you know, kind of all these debates about, that we have recent debates about, kind of, you know, the colonial social science and things like that, there is no attempt to, to denationalize de social science. We kind of reify these categories, we keep them, uh, with us and, and, and in, in that respect, I think that's important for us perhaps to debate later on. So I'll stop here now to, uh, I probably used my 10 minutes, uh, probably more than 10. Uh, okay, thanks. Thank you, Sinisha, uh, again, for these great ideas. Uh, our third presenter will be Umut Eskarimli. 
a senior researcher fellow at the IBEI in Barcelona and professor at Blanquerna Raymond Law University. Umut is also a senior researcher associate at the Barcelona Center for International Affairs. Uh, Umut's research focuses on theories of contemporary debates in nationalism. He is also an expert in uh, nationalism related issues um, in the area of Turkey and Greece. Umut, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, and thanks for the invitation, uh, like all the others. And, and I was kind of having palpitations here, uh, scared that Shinisha or Jujia will uh, probably mention some of the things that I would mention, especially when Shinisha said, OK, I have four uh, kind of areas to focus. And I said, OK, OK, let's just be, you know, hang on tight here. Uh, but uh, well, I guess, you know, without staging anything, without being in touch or having any discussion before, we managed to have a complementary discussion because what I'm going to be saying is a little bit more kind of, I don't know, I think I'll be a little bit more radical because uh, in the sense that uh, uh, not, not being disrespectful, but in many ways, something that I've written in the last edition of theories of nationalism is that, you know, uh, I already had enough myself, but I knew uh, through my students and my colleagues that the classical debate, which was a debate of its time and necessary and, and extremely helpful for us to understand nations and nationalism, I think that debate, what we call, uh, Shinisha and Zhuzha also referred to it as the classical, the canon, that debate is over. Uh, and I think it is good that it's over. I mean, we should not be uh, discussing about who is an ethnosymbolist, who is a primordialist, who is a modernist, when is the nation, uh, I mean, uh, allow me to be a little bit informal here. Uh, like, I mean, who cares whether it was the first, you know, ancient Greeks or ancient Israel was the first nation. Nationalism is with us and we have urgent problems. Some of them already mentioned by Zhuzha and Sinisa. So, you know, um, it was something that was necessary. Uh, it was pretty much the life's work of Anthony, the late Anthony Smith, uh, that all of us know in respect. And, and I learned a lot from him. But I guess um, there was a mismatch, growing, growing gap between the debate, the theoretical debate on nationalism and the proverbial realities on the ground. I mean, you know, this was, this was not the case when we were students in the late 80s and 90s, especially because of the end of the Cold War, but it became more and more obsolete, I think, as time went by, especially uh, because it turned too polemical. Uh, between the so-called modernists and the so-called, you know, the other side. Um, so I think, you know, uh, uh, just like Kuhn's, uh, perf you know, an amazing uh, and still uh, quite valid metaphor of paradigm shift, uh, that is, that has happened uh, in many ways uh, without someone trying to get rid of an old paradigm, but it was basically, it had its time. Uh, since I talk about the Olympics, uh, you know, we can talk about the organicist metaphor, like a, a human body which growed and, and now, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of, you know, it grew itself uh, and the, the shirt is not fitting anymore. So basically we need to expand the field, which was happening already. I mean, some of the works that have been mentioned uh, before was uh, actually a step uh, towards this direction. Now, two points here. Um, I mean, Kuhn's uh, idea of paradigm shift uh, for when you have to teach research, research techniques after so many years, you have to revisit all these philosophy of science things. Uh, I mean, it's not about discarding what came before. Uh, I mean, we learned a lot from the debate uh, that in sociology, anthropology, uh, and, and to a lesser extent, as you said, in social psychology, and we will keep, I mean, the new discussions that we will have in, in several other fields will build on these things. I mean, we are not going to leave Anderson behind. We'll just, I think we have to leave behind certain questions to begin with, when is the nation? But, you know, uh, the other stuff, what is a nation, what is nationhood, uh, and all of these things will build on uh, the heritage that we all actually, you know, inherited uh, from, from the pioneers of nationalism studies. So we should move on uh, and move on in, in 
two directions. I had a very, very simplistic uh, kind of uh, idea that I used in 2017, and I talked about it. Basically, I said a double challenge of nationalism, but it's, it was a very simple idea. It's, it's one thing was that in the 1990s, there was, of course, you know, huge debate about the transcendence of the nation state, globalization, et cetera, et cetera. And we all knew that this was, you know, much exaggerated. Uh, but there are still transnational, I mean, pull and push factors, as in migration studies. There are things that transcend national boundaries uh, and maybe, uh, you know, uh, kind of induce us to think that nationalism or nation states have become obsolete. Uh, that's not the case, as we know, uh, but there are still definitely trans transnational challenges. I mean, the pandemic was one uh, expression of that. Actually, the pandemic in itself was it was expression of the double challenge, because the second aspect of it is that the nation states and nationalism was, is, are still with us and will be with us. Uh, for the time, you know, for, for the foreseeable future. And the pandemic was a really good example of that. On the one hand, we needed international collaboration, you know, uh, uh, like the uh, proliferation of supply routes, et cetera, et cetera. All, all of a sudden the world realized how dependent they are in, in raw material produced in India, for instance, or in China. But on the other hand, the very first reaction of all pretty much most nation states was to close down their borders. So basically the double challenge was there palpably, very visibly there. I mean, like on the one hand, challenges that transcend national boundaries, you know, uh, broadly construed, but then uh, the tendency of, of, of nation states to deal with that within their boundaries. Uh, and, and, you know, we can see examples of it everywhere. Now, the first, uh, the, the, the first point that I made, the fact that the old debate is, is over, the classical debate, is still important for the second, uh, I mean, like the, to face, to, to deal with these challenges, because uh, it is especially important uh, in understanding the resilience of nation states, national identity and nationalism. So all the works that, that you know, uh, the primordialists, the modernists have produced actually uh, are helping us to make better sense of the longevity of the resilience of nationalism and nation states. Uh, Sinisa is making very uh, good use of that in his sociological understandings, showing how nationalisms are grounded. You know, come back to that term. Um, but also, and here I will be a little bit more political and provocative, there are the normative issues related with nationalism. And, and as we all now know, especially in, the, in I'm, I'm considering like, you know, us as a kind of small family of nationalism scholars and students, uh, we do know that ethnic civic, uh, I mean, you know, it's, it may be helpful in understanding certain things, but I mean, it's not a valid distinction anymore, but there, there are still uh, challenges that is posed by different types of nationalism. I think the classical debate is also helping us right now, again, unintentionally, uh, to make better sense of some of the positions that we used to call, say, perennialist primordialist. I mean, those people who used to be called themselves or in their, you know, PhD dissertations, Anthony's ethno symbolist framework, are today, you know, out, you know, in in the kind of, you know, uh, limelight, writing about populism and all of that, and actually. Uh, and I'm here, I'm talking about, for instance, uh, well, I mean, this is a public debate, like Eric Kaufman's white shift, you know, an, an almost an unabashed uh, defense of white nationalism, uh, or Yoram Hazoni's uh, project of national conservatism, uh, which is funded by uh, uh, the far right positions. I mean, the primordialist position or the ethno symbolist posi position today transmogrified into open nationalism, which we kind of suspected and wrote about, but you know, now we're seeing better these things uh, now that things have changed. Which brings me to my final point. I will use the term grounding here. Uh, Sinisa's last book, uh, to, to the best of my knowledge, by the way, because he's very prolific and I'm not sure I'm, you know, the uh, grounded nationalisms. I mean, he uses grounded in a different sense, like to, to, to actually show us the different ways in which Nationalism is grounded sociologically, ideologically, historically, et cetera, et cetera. Now I'm going to use it in a more simplistic dictionary definition of, of the sense of the term. We need to ground the study of nationalism. Like the study of nationalism now needs to come to terms with actual debates that are going on around 
uh, Juj Juj actually made some points about that, you know, noting the, the um, West-centric or Eurocentric nat nature of nationalism. Uh, Shinisa touched upon his own uh, areas, violence, war, etc., etc. Well, I'm going to be touching on some others because you know this is the work that I'm doing right now. To, to be honest, I'm not working on theories of nationalism or no, on nationalism as such anymore because I think it's pointless, uh, and that's why I didn't uh, you know want to do a fourth edition to theories of nationalism because it's a good history book now. You know, if you want to know about the debate. You can read about it as a kind of historiographical, you know, uh, debate, uh, which sums up the main theories and all. But now we need more, and and you know, uh, and there are signs of it. I mean, one of it, one one uh, new one 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 of the couple, you know, a couple of things that attracted my attention was a foreign affairs uh, March April two thousand nineteen issue on new nationalisms. Now I don't think there is anything new what they were talking about there, but it was a it was an attempt to deal with the normative question. What kind of nationalism do we need? I mean, it was of course a response to far right populism. Uh, it was a response to Trump, to Brexit, to, to Orban, to, to all sorts of things. Um, and there were one side, on the one side, you had people who argued against nationalism as a, as a you know, like it's from time immemorial, immemorial almost, and those who were against. Um, but, you know, it, this is something that we need to come to terms with. I mean, I don't think they are new in any sense, but yes, nationalism, but what kind of nationalism and how do we deal with this? Another good example of this kind of work was uh, a special issue of Nationalism and Nationalism, the journal of ASAN uh, that uh, Sabolz mentioned. Uh, the, the debate, like the, the special issue on populism and nationalism because everybody pretty much assumes that there's almost, you know, these two terms could be used interchangeably, which is of course a huge mistake as Roger Sprubaker has written, lots of other people have written about it. But yes, this is the kind of work we need to do now because uh, we do have uh, a really kind of unabashedly right-wing type of nationalism. Certain things that were beyond the pale in the past, like racism are now openly uh, and, and respectably debated. Um, one of these, I mean, like, as I said, the debate on white nationalism, the, 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 the whole position which has been, you know, covered under the umbrella term, alt-right, far-right, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but also there is the left version of it, uh, uh, starting from Chantal Mouffe's, you know, uh, plea for a left wing, I mean, because she does recognize as more of most of us do. And here I need to maybe, you know, uh, while I'm ending slowly make a confession, I'm less anti-nationalist than before, because, you know, I was considered to be the kind of, you know, uh, as the postmodern blah, blah. I mean, I never thought I was, but the point is, yes, I was much more hostile to nationalism as a feeling, uh, as a sentiment, but, uh, Chantal Mouffe talks about uh, the strong libidinal, you know, investment in the work, uh, you know, in the work of the national, because, you know, she wants to build another front against right-wing populism, and her political project is based on resuscitating or actually reclaiming nationalism from the right wing. Now, I don't agree with the specifics of her theory, but I think this is something, and that will be my conclusion, this is something that we should be thinking about, yes. I mean, uh, nationalism, should be reclaimed somehow. And I don't know what we will call it uh, or how we will define it. And that's a huge project. But right now the left is too much, uh, and this is my new work is focused on. I'm not, it's, it's more on identity politics and populism than anything else. Nationalism now is, is something that we need to really reclaim, uh, uh, but reclaim in a different way and, and try to kind of, you know, uh, use in, in may, maybe, you know, kind of, also integrating both the local and the global into it, which is a possibility, but it's difficult. So basically we need to be more kind of receptive. I think that this platform, even the idea, the birth of this platform using the online channels to, to open up to, to larger uh, audiences, et cetera, this is the kind of work we need to do, I think. I mean, you know, we need to read, respect, learn uh, what has come before us. Uh, but then move on to face the challenges of today. Uh, I mean, 
something that uh, yeah i mean we knew that that probably there will be lots of questions there but the quest the, the simple example that shinisha gave in the end is important why even the most anti-nationalist of 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 people that we've known i don't but many do many of my friends are today using the ukrainian flag to show our support for the ukrainian people we don't perceive this as a kind of a nationalist stance or 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 standing for uh, a right wing type of ukrainian nationalism that you know a couple of you know 5% of of ukrainian politicians would still support no it's it's kind of changing and uh, and and even and that would be my last and the most provocative point even certain transnational identity movements such as the transgender rights movement today i i will argue if i don't if i'm going to be convincing or not is something to be seen uh, you'll see it in, a, in in the next 6 7 months uh, even as such as a movement such as the well, international far right obviously but also the transgender rights the lgbt movement etc with its insistence on having a separate flag with its own terminology with its own rituals is almost almost functioning like a religious or national uh, uh, kind of formation in many ways, ideologically, discursively, and tactically, by the way. Uh, so these are the challenges that we need to, I think, meet. Invented traditions, yes, but that was a huge term. And, and Hobsbawm knew about it. And, and we should actually go back to this idea and see what those invented traditions are. Thank you. Thank you so much, Umut. Thank you again for all the three of you. Now I will pass the floor on to Gazim, who will moderate the discussion. Thank you, Sabosh. Thanks to all the speakers for, I think, great presentation. And definitely we have plenty of food for thought. So already we have some questions. So the first question is actually from Eric for Ruja. You welcome the globalization of nationalism studies. But do you think that the fact that many of the nation states in the non-Western world do not fit the ideal of the ethnically, culturally homogeneous states has an impact on how nationalism is studied? It's studied, I guess, in in, in non-Western context. Yes, uh, thank you. And yes, I do think that um, the fact that many of the nations, the, the states that were created in the non-Western world and where people were told to now go be a nation, um, that um, those are not ethnically, culturally homogeneous, that this has an impact, I think it does. And I think that's a good thing because, because we have a great deal to learn from scholars who are who are studying and writing about those cases. And I'm thinking, for example, one uh, scholar whose work I find, I, I find uh, really insightful and enlightening is Lisa Bedin's work, for example, who writes about, uh, about Yemen. Um, the book uh, is titled Peripheral Visions. And it's a book about how citizens in a newly formed state that doesn't have a lot of legitimacy are forming national attachments from below, which, which challenges many of the assumptions uh, and many of the findings, they were not just assumptions, but many of the, of the findings, comparative findings that were coming from other cases of, of nation building. So I think, I think this, I'd like to tie this also to the question that Sobwatch um, tied into the chat about, what we think each of us think about uh, the one or you know some major question that is particularly salient today and i'd like to bring it back to this question about why people need nationalism or and when they do and and i think that this is something that needs to to motivate to continue to motivate research at the micro level meso level uh, all levels, because, because there has been a lot written about nationalism as a political strategy, nationalism as, 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 some, as, as a strategy that states use for, to create legitimacy, because obviously nation building is a very effective way of creating legitimacy. It's much easier to sustain 
a state, any kind of state. If people are, if a, if a large number of people are attached to it, in which case you don't have to constantly use force <laughs> to impose yourself, but there is an attachment already there in a large segment of the population. So national, so so there we understand that from the perspective of of state. Um, state elites and, and state stability and regional security questions. But what makes it what makes it necessary for people? And I think this links back to what Umut was also talking about, that we all need to look a little more carefully about people's need to form community, belonging, and to place themselves. And I think this is what this is about. I'm, I'm beginning to think uh, even more um, currently that this really is about people placing themselves in a larger story. You become part, you're not just your little self, but you're becoming part of a larger story that has a narrative. Even if people are not necessarily buying into, they know it's a national myth, they know it's a made up uh, myth, uh, a symbol, they know it's, uh, it's contested, but they can improve it. It's improvable. It's revisable, and you still can become, uh, be part of part of a, a community that gives you a larger sense of a sense of uh, purpose and of being of existence. I suppose so. This is also why I was emphasizing the need to look into learn more from uh, social psychology. Thank you, Juja. So the second question that Juja already addressed was about the kind of the most prominent political socially issues in nationalism studies. So does anyone else want to address this question, Sinisha or Umut? Yeah, I mean, there's so, so many topics. So I, I wouldn't identify just single one. I think all of these that I was talking about are really very pertinent. They're happening at the moment. and. And I think the, the example of, of uh, you know, how nationalism is, is you know, but Umut made that point as well. It, it, you know, the thing is with nationalism, it, it has so many different forms. It's a malleable, it's a plastic ideology. And, you know, until only a few years ago, we, you know, people were obsessed with how nationalism and populism are related and it's all far right. But now in, 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 the, in the context of Ukraine, we see that, you know, immediately how nationalism can turn into something very different. So that is a problem, you know, for us to understand, to conceptualize, to see, you know, we, we uh, in the concepts that we use are very much linked to the character of a state in which we live. You know, we all live in nation states, uh, nation states legitimize their existence through nation centric, uh, uh, you know, categories through every day and, and also officially to institutions, organizations that they possess. So it's impossible for us to, to, to escape these categories as long as we live in the world of nation states. So what is the alternative? The alternative can be, unfortunately, an empire. And this is what some people are trying to do. And empires have their own issues and their own hierarchies and their own different ways of understanding. Uh, so, so, I mean, Jujia is right in a sense, you know, there is the micro element here for us to understand. You know, we, we, we are collective, we are, we are social beings as human beings and uh, psychology and, and also micro, I would emphasize more micro sociology does help us a great deal in understanding this dynamic. But what's also interesting, how ideologies tap into that kind of micro world and make nations uh, into these absolute categories that one has to identify with, not, not, not class, not uh, status group, not profession, not something else. So that, that is an interesting thing, you know, and why, uh, regardless of w whether you come politically from the right or left or somewhere in the center, you know, nationhood is there and, and it's just, you know, I, I would say it, it, it keeps this grounding is going on and it, it's, it's stronger. You know, than it was 20 years ago, there was 50 years ago, and not to mention, you know, 200 years ago. Thank you, Sinisha. So there's one question specifically for Umet. So it's by Alexander Maxwell. So if democracy is the rule of the people and the people is some subset of the whole human race, then it seems to me that all democracy is a subset of nationalism. If you want to reclaim nationalism for the left, why not just start using the word nationalism to describe progressive incarnations of nationalism. It's very expected from Alex that uh, we are having this conversation on Facebook comment uh, pages. Well, to be honest, I don't think the naming is, is so important, uh, Alex, I mean, uh, or in general. I mean, 
I certainly don't think there is a difference uh, like this, this whole uh, enterprise of differentiating between patriotism and nationalism, which we know is uh, both artificial, but also uh, very contextual. I mean, you know, in, in certain uh, countries, then, I mean, nationalism is the good version and patriotism is the bad version. It then depends on, you know, where you live, how you define all of these things. And actually, you know, probably the only good thing Trump did uh, during his presidency was to reclaim the word nationalism said, why are we talking about patriotism? You know, I'm a nationalist. Uh, and he actually named it as such. So uh, the only reason that I would still avoid the use of the term nationalism is the historical connotations of the term. Now, how do we start a progress of uh, a process of reclaiming nationalism for a much better and progressive version? I think, you know, uh, nationalism not only historically but even you know from the right today is so much associated with exclusion exclusion of what which and how of course differs again con from one context to the next but i think you know if you want to have an inc more inclusive understanding of this communal feeling that juja referred to uh, the solidarity building aspects of it etc first of all we need to be much more tolerant towards minorities, all kinds of minorities. I'm not talking about ethnic minorities here only, uh, but also open to international cooperation, solidarity, et cetera. I mean, uh, just, just like that. Uh, and would uh, the connotations of nationalism allow us to do that? Would the right wing, which will try to, uh, I mean, you know, it's like when, when the real thing is there, no one would want a copy of it. So the real thing, is what pretty much Trump and and the like. Obviously, I mean, we we will, we would like to call them far right, but we know that that is not the case anymore. I mean, if, a little bit of uh, overview of the literature on the far right today would would actually the first point would that would emerge is how these discourses now today have been mainstreamed and normalized. Uh, I mean, Macron is speaking about Islamo, uh, you know, uh, fascism, et cetera, et cetera, or, or the Danish social democrats, the quintessential example of, uh, of, of, you know, the anti-immigration position together with a social welfare state. So uh, Alex is living in New Zealand, uh, a kind of a small uh, uh, heaven, I would say, uh, ruled by social democrats, yes. Um, would, would Jacinda call herself a nationalist? I don't know. But the point is, I think we agree on the project of reclaiming uh, the feeling of commonality. And if the only thing that remains is what name should we use for it, I think, you know, we would have gone quite far, then I'll, I'm sure we'll find a term for it. And yeah, let's let it let it be nationalism, who cares? Thank you, Mitsu. We have two kind of long questions or comments. First one is by Shabosh and then the other one is by Carla Basta. I think it would make more sense if you guys switch on the camera and make the comment or the question as opposed to me reading this long comment, if you don't mind. Shabosh, do you want to go first? Yeah, yeah, sure, I can, no problem. Um, so I'll, I'll read my comment. Uh, so uh, this is a question related to uh, Umut's point. Uh, on the uh, inherent political implications of nationalism studies. Umut, you mentioned Kaufman and Hazon, and if I understood you correctly, you claim that they are presenting basically a far-right political ideology as scholarship. Um, and Chantal Mouf doing something similar on the left, as a left-wing populist. Um, I just would add that constructivists in the study of nationalism uh, are often accused of being at least a or even anti-nationalist. So uh, I wonder to what extent can, and if it is possible, to what extent we should study nationalism as scholars in a purely a political and objective, I mean, in, in the sense of Max, uh, Max Weber. So can we study and should we study nationalism in a purely objective, a political, unbiased way? Thank you. Sabash, uh, just a, you may, a, want to address? Yeah, just quickly. First of all, I would never and ever think of putting Chantal Mouffe on the left and Eric on the right on the same, you know, that was a completely different thing. Uh, Chantal Mouffe's project of, of resuscitating nationalism is completely different. Whereas, 
yeah, the other one is, is, is uh, I mean, I can't go into details here and it will be irrelevant in any case, but I mean, you know, that's a far right uh, position. Uh, no, but the, the more important point is, no, I'm not, well, exactly this point. I mean, uh, when I was writing about the discourse of nationalism or talking about constructivism, one of the main challenge that I had was trying to, uh, I mean, this is this is the territory of Sinisa. I mean, I don't want to go into sociology, but I mean, constructionism or social constructionism of the symbolic interactionist kind never denied the reality of something in any case. You know, it's, it's the process in which certain things have acquired actually reality and perceived reality for people. So, so uh, even then I was uh, not apolitical. I was actually anti-nationalist. And the journey that I talked about actually today has brought me to appreciate the importance of common bonds of belonging more. So I don't think that we can study nationalism or any social ideology or discourse or you know any kind of similar thing in an apolitical way. That's one. And two, I mean, my position today is much more sympathetic to, to these common bonds than before. So yeah, uh, Weberian, definitely. <laughs> Thank you. Carlo, do you want to jump in? Sure. Thank you very much. My apologies for the long comments. It is a comment. I just uh, read Eric's question as well. And I, I think my comment basically is along the same lines. Um, and, and, and in a sense, reflects some of the concerns in the presentation. Uh, in the presentations of all three of you. So I, I guess the comment slash questions to all three, which is, it strikes me that so there was a question out there about some of the key lines. What are, what are some of the key debates and, and, and sort of the most prominent lines of inquiry, inquiry in nationalism studies? Um, I, I would also kind of my curiosity is about what isn't being talked about, right? And I think one of the things is the possibility that there are huge swathes of population out there. And again, this relates to, to kind of Western centrism, broadly speaking, of of uh, not only nationalism studies, but social sciences more broadly, um, that might not be national at all. Um, and what I mean by that is that there are other lines of collective solidarity, and I mentioned a few there, caste, religion, uh, tribal, uh, traditional authority, et cetera. And I'm wondering, especially to the extent to which uh, principles not only of modern nationhood, but also modern statehood undercut those or are inimical to those kinds of solidarity, whether or not we can talk about people who primarily think of themselves in those terms as in some sense national. And then if we can't, what are the implications for the study of nationalism, but also, you know, any other kind of legitimacy project, broadly speaking. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. So who wants to respond? Yes, thank you, Carlo. Thank you for being here and thank you for asking that question. And um, I think this is also a question about how nationhood, national belonging uh, differs from those other kinds of belonging and also whether, whether it has to supersede it. And being a political scientist, I'm thinking that the political structure is always there <laughs> and the power structure is always there. And just like it's very difficult for people around the world to uh, escape globalization, it's extremely difficult for people living in any community to escape the international system, which is based on this model in which there are states with boundaries and there's an assumption that those states are um, free to build nations. And, and so I think when I um, highlighted the question of, you know, we need to find out why people need nationalism, where and when they do, that also involves this part of an answer to your question that people don't always need it, not everyone needs it. And there are all kinds of other communal solidarity and identification. So what we learned from the anthropological, from the Barthian school about ethnic boundary maintenance and boundary making, I think is remains relevant, right? And also what we learned from you know, political scientists who talk about a state nation 
uh, Linzen Stepan uh, and Yadav's book about India, right? A state nation as opposed or versus the nation state, which Modi is now trying to shift to since 2014 in India. So I guess the idea, I guess the idea I'm trying to convey here or the or 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 the opinion, I suppose, is that is that in my view, so long as there is this international system in which this particular model of statehood and this particular kind of state legitimation has become predominant because of its success, because of its success, it's extremely difficult for other kinds of communities not to continue existing because they do. The clans, the you know, tribes, the I think ethnicity is, is a tribe too, but um, and religion is very similar to all of these are socially constructed, all of these have to do with kinship, all of these have to do with boundary making. And boundaries always bond and keep you inside, but some boundaries make it possible for you to bridge. There is sociological literature about that. And so all of that, I think, is there, but nationhood is attached to this particular state model. And I think the big question about that, again, is whether um, is going to change. And what uh, Sinisha was emphasizing about imperialism and nationalism cohabiting, I think is really important that we need to look at how are we at a point now where these two, the cohabitation of these two is going to somehow shift uh, the norms, the predominance uh, in the international system. But, but anyway, so I think, I think nationhood, nation building, still is considered to be the most effective way of linking people to states of various kinds. Let's stop there. Yeah, thank you. So yeah, just before Sinisha answers, just to kind of read uh, Eric's question, which is similar. So can we already imagine a world beyond nationalism slash nation, nation states? And then there is a reference to ISIS as a kind of borderless or a, a type on an attempt to create a state without fixed borders. Sinisha? Yeah, so th this is a good, good example that he gave because I wanted to mention that. As well. So we, we do, I mean, I completely agree with Georgia in a sense, we do have an international system which is shaped around the nation state, but we can look at that also internally, you know, how do nation states behave. So we do have all these social cleavages in forms of solidarity, class and clan and religion and everything else. Uh, but nation, you know, the fact that the, the nation states are, are so powerful and, and so legitimate internally and externally allows them to, to dominate constantly, to nationalize. So, you know, nationhood is not a, not a, some sort of a normal thing of how people would see themselves. We are, we are built for, to live in a much smaller groups, you know, for 99% of our existence on this planet, we lived in hunting, hunting gathering uh, type of, you know, communities, which, which were not sedentary, you know, so, so in a sense, once states came in 10,000 years ago, everything has changed. And, and particularly in the last 150 years when nation states gradually started to you know, cage us in, into these institutions. So in a sense, uh, you know, we are constantly nationalized. Uh, so, so in a sense, it's very difficult to escape that. You know, there are people who try to resist this uh, from anarchists to academics <laughs> and anybody in between, but it's extremely difficult to do that because, you know, in a sense, we are born with that system. We are shaped by these institutions, they constantly force us to do this, you know, and, and look at people in Ukraine, they, you know, they were musicians, they were, you know, uh, uh, school uh, students, they, you know, they did all so, sorts of things, something happens now, they all have to be Ukrainians, first and foremost, but nothing there, it, 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 you know, so, so this happens, and, and it shows, you know, the strength of, of, of the whole is institutional framework of the nation states where we live. And ISIS is a good example. So we had an entity which tried to create something that is not a nation state, that is caliphate, that is more like an empire, and, and it failed utterly. But even if you look at, you know, uh, people have published now, there's a lot of, you know, uh, on, on, the, on the internal structure of ISIS, and it resembles nation states in, in many ways. You know, it has a ministry for that, a ministry for that, the education system, you know, it teaches certain, so, so it, it resembles nation state in many respects, even though it was very much officially against nationalism, and it, 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 it was crushed ultimately. Thank you, Sinisha. So there was a, a, a question earlier on about nationalism as ideology and nationalism as a discourse and how they relate it. And I have a, a question for Sinisha because you mentioned the relationship between nationalism, nation state, and 
uh, empires or imperial forms of organization. And I think it's kind of related to Ukraine, not so much about Ukraine, the war, the invasion, but about Putin's famous text, which I wonder whether in a few years' time it will be given to students as a primary text similar to mm -hmm. Stalin's or Lenin's understanding of, of, of nations and who has the right to nation. Although this is a very different because it could be claimed that it's a way of um, a superpower, a, a, a great power with imperial impulses, actually explaining the way to destroy a nation state, which in this case is, is Ukraine. So it could be this an indication of great powers with imperial instincts, basically engaging in a process of destroying nations. So in a way, kind of going the opposite way of nation states destroying empires, what we witnessed for a very long period in late 19th, early 20th century. Yeah. No, no, I mean, you're right in a sense. So we do have this, I mean, all big states uh, were not only nation states. So I mean, we do live in a world nation state, but there's always that imperial element present. So US has dominated much of the kind of post-Cold War in, in intervening, you know, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, and a few other places, uh, which showed that it was not an ordinary nation state. It was able to do things that many other states were not able to do. And then, you know, we, we saw that elements of that with the British state, with the French state, you know, in, in Africa and other places. And, and, and more recently, Turkey and Russia have been behaving in that way in China, perhaps to the lesser extent, but it has enormous capacity to do that. So, so you know, a, a big powerful nation states have an imperial elements to that. But there was always that, you know, thing that, you know, we, we live in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an international system that doesn't allow you changing borders mm -hmm. without agreement. Uh, so that that seems to be changing now. That was an element of that present in, in the Syrian war, but still, ultimately, the Syrian state remained officially. I think it was this, and and we don't, you know, we see that impulse present in Ukraine. And you are right, you know, the speech that, that Putin gave was was a pretext for that. I wouldn't I wouldn't put him in the same category as Lenin and Stalin. They were still intellectuals. Even Stalin was much more of an intellectual than Putin. Putin yeah, intellectual. So so this is just a kind of rumbling of, of, of somebody who was obviously preparing to, to fight in a war. Uh, but we could use it for other, you know, as another example of something trying to justify this kind of thing. Mm. Yes, but you, you're right, you know, we, we do, we are, we are now obviously, uh, and I think this, is, this hasn't started with this war, it, it has been happening now for a while. So the international system now is, is at, at the brink of, of some change, uh, which we will see in which direction this will go. Thank you. So anyone else wants to discuss or to say anything about nationalism as ideology versus nationalism as a discourse? If I may very briefly. Yeah, please. I mean, again, there are these debates uh, on, on discourse uh, from, from post-structuralism, uh, you know, where they challenged the notion of ideology because that ideology was traditionally associated with Marxism. But over the last, I think, 20 years, we, we moved away from these debates. So, so people use ideology in, in discourse in different directions. So I, I use ideology more than discourse. For me, discourse is much narrower concept than ideology. So that's why ideology, but it doesn't necessarily have to have a, any connotations linked to any specific tradition of thinking. Thank you. So any other questions or comments we have about seven, eight minutes left and just wanted to thank, to thank Harris Milonas who is here with us and has been very helpful posting some useful links in relation to some of the questions. So thank you, Harris. May I also say, um, Kazim, that, um, yep. that uh, Harris's, Harris's work uh, together with um, Maya Tudor the piece they published in, yeah, I think included Harris, I'm sure, I'm sure you have included the link in the chat or I hope you have to the article about the state of nationalism um, in the American political science uh, annual review, which I think, I think is excellent, especially, especially if um, you are, interested in, in primarily political science approaches to it, which have been, um, I think, predominant in the field in recent, in recent decades, even though the canonical studies were written by sociologists and anthropologists and um, Gellner became the favorite of political scientists, not coincidentally, because he so clearly defined it as, 
as a political principle that aims to create coherence between the state and the nation. And that's just clear enough and it gives us what we need for um, discussing it, approaching it from the perspective of, of power. Right. So, um, so I'd like to I'd like to also also say that that we have learned a lot from other fields, but political scientists entered a little later. And sometimes, what we learned and was a big deal and new thing and pushing the boundary from our perspective was, if not passe, then mainstream understanding and common sense in other in other fields. So it might be the case that. We have benefited more from multidisciplinarity than, than our colleagues. And uh, I apologize if that's the case, but there have been political scientists recently, especially in the last couple of decades who have done political ethnography, looking at micro level studies of conflict like uh, Leanne Fuji and, um, and Cheryl Strohschein and others who have contributed to, to that debate as well. So I'm hoping that we are continuing to contribute to multidisciplinarity as well. Thank you. So we don't have any more questions. So if any of the speakers want any final words or before we wrap up, so uh, I mean, it goes without saying that for all of the people who joined us, so we're, we're very privileged to have you. And my recommendation would be that you keep following these wonderful scholars and read their works, but also keep following us on different social media so to look up for next event so Umid, do you want to add something no just uh thank everybody and 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 stay uh on social media uh twitter instagram the, there's a lot happening there so yeah and again another reminder the next virtual meeting is on 23rd of june with john fox on everyday nationalism so again Follow people from Leiden, CU, Loughborough, Edinburgh, ASN and ASN, ASN. So two, mm -hmm. two slightly different great associations of nationalism scholars. And yeah, hope to meet everyone at some other scholarly event. So thanks a lot again for all the presentations and the lively discussion and have a nice afternoon slash evening. Thank you guys. Thank you, Kesem. Thank you.